see, that's what moved into the office next door to me at Harvard. <laughs> I mean, I was really trying to be what my mother said. <laughs> but what, what chance did I have? <laughs> oh, it's a delight. And I really want to honor Timothy. Timothy was uh, a person who took me out of uh, faith worse than death. <laughs> which was being a successful citizen. <laughs> and, uh, started me on a journey that I uh, think is the richest uh, possible journey I could have had in a lifetime. And I think that he was the first ray of light for me. Uh, on it. saying that this week in Congress, in the joint session of Congress, the new president of Czechoslovakia said, without a global revolution in the sphere of human consciousness, nothing will change for the better in the sphere of our being. months back that we saw the old Romanian president saying, this will never happen here. <laughs> and even now, I'm afraid President Bush and uh, Mr. Sununu are trying to figure out how to contain the damage and potential chaos in which they lose their unstable king of the mountain position. <laughs> But it is clear now that a historically irreversible process has started. And that's exactly what happened in the 60s. A historically irreversible process started. It didn't really start there, as Tim pointed out. It, has, it goes way back in all of human history. But something did happen in the 60s that was prepared for by doors of perception, that was prepared for by the beats in the 50s, uh, something happened that was of no less moment than what has just happened in Eastern Europe and Tiananmen Square and so on. And we are all now cleaning up after it, not in a negative sense, but figuring out what to do with the fact that it happened. And we can hardly understand the implications of what it means in our lives. And we are sitting here often feeling like we are the downtrodden. And it's quite the reverse. We have figured out how it happened. And now as people in, on the platform have said in the earlier panel, now it's up to each individual, one of us. The way Gandhi said, my life is my message. Now the way each of us lives makes a statement that it did work, that it did happen. I can't really any longer be frightened of the dragons of government. I can't really because I see how ephemeral and how paper tigerish they are. And I feel the fear in the culture. And I feel that the, what's required of us is interesting. I, I find myself in a funny position today because I'm I'm caught between um, Rick's desire for us to put forward a good face to be responsible researchers, to play a part in the game of Western science. And I'm also on the other side seeing that what has happened is far more profound than that. Right. And that what we are doing now is trying to find a way to bring more people along through trying to legitimize our game in society. But the underground process in which 
psychedelics have continued to be used in the society and have come into mainstream consciousness, that goes on independent of whether we lose or win on the front we're talking about in research. Because it was just in the same way as when we did the Good Friday study of Dr. Pankey. We were doing a double-blind placebo study, and all of us realized the absurdity of that. That the question of whether psychedelics was anything or not, for anybody who had taken them, <laughs> was quite an irrelevant question. And yet, that study was done, and it was a brilliant product of our days at Harvard, I think. I think that Walter, and Walter refused to take drugs until after he completed the study, so people wouldn't accuse him of what they accused us of, of sipping our own whiskey. <laughs> and I want to point out that in, um, in very recently, Rick here has done a follow-up of Walter Penke's Good Friday study and has really gone back and found those people who turned on in Marsh Chapel at Boston University. And what he found were, was among the experimental group, the people that had psilocybin, long-term persisting effects included enhanced appreciation of life and nature, a deepening sense of joy, a commitment to their vocation, an enhanced appreciation of unusual experiences and emotions, increased tolerance of other religious systems, deepening equanimity in the face of difficult life crises, greater compassion for other people's minorities and nature, su increased subsequent participation in civil rights, anti-Vietnam, etc. Timeless eternity and death is not seen as fearful, as so fearful, therefore they are willing to take more risks. Now that is almost 30 years later of a group of minister students who took psilocybin in Marsh Chapel on Good Friday. And as you recall of the experimental subjects in the double-blind placebo study, Nine of them had some criteria that would class that as a religious mystical experience. And in the control group, one of the ten had one of the nine criteria. In other words, it's not nothing. If you, if you need it to be, make sure to understand that. Now, <clears throat> I was asked to talk about um, what are the benefits of what we did in the 60s and what are our mistakes. Tim didn't deal with what he might have done differently, so, uh, but I can play the straight part, which I've done doing with Tim for years. <laughs> Here are the things that happened, as I can see it, from what started in that period. First of all, the culture broke out of the psycho psychotomimetic model of using chemicals. That up until then, in this society, primarily these chemicals were considered psychosis-inducing and under the control of the psychiatric establishment. These chemicals started to be seen, these herbs and plants, started to be seen as sacraments as they are used in other societies. They were used for creative purposes, and the therapeutic possibilities started to become apparent. The chemicals in the early 60s among the 15 to 25 year olds became a rite of passage, which was shown in the Woodstock moment. In a culture very sadly lacking in rites of passage, where there is a lot of confusion about shift from childhood to maturity. That period made us clear that it wasn't just the chemical you ingested, but it was the set and setting. And here, of course, the traditions like the American Indian, the shamanic traditions, 
We knew all that, but we never listened to it. After I started with psychedelics, suddenly books that I had passed on the bookshelf saying, what a bunch of rot, suddenly became the most treasured volumes for me. <coughs> books of American Indian law, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, things like that, the uh, Upanishads and the Vedas. In other words, it opened our link to the East and to an incredibly rich philosophical, psychological, and spiritual heritage of humanity that we had primarily been closed to, except for Max Mueller, just a very few things. It really opened us to the East, and I've been living off it ever since. <laughs> And the way, partly the way it did that was because the chemicals in the psychedelics allowed us to override our habits of thinking. And when we looked around in Western psychology for models about that, they were absent. And when we looked in the East, in things like the Vasudhi Maga, there they were very beautifully articulated, and here were a group of people in the East that we had treated really as almost as barbarians, that had a wisdom about human consciousness that became, and they became our elders. One of them, of course, became our guru. So it opened us to meditation and spiritual practices. Of course, it became faddish in the 70s, but beyond the fads of gurus and all that, there was a deep process, and there is a deep meditative uh, investment in this society at this moment, whether you call it stress reduction or whatever you call it, it's there and it's growing all the time. And that's part of the result of what happened in the 60s. It opened ways for networking because it opened our horizontal power structures rather than our vertical heart power structures. And that's part of the information age that Tim's talking about now. In a way, it was a precursor of that in allowing us to uh, see vertical institutions as much more ephemeral. And that was the deeper part of the shift that happened then, which I think is the most fundamental shift, which was the shift in our perception of reality. That we, what happened to us was what I think Einstein did to Newton. It went from treating a reality as absolute to seeing that all realities are relative. And the minute you do that, social institutions are up for grabs. That changes the whole ballgame right there. And that is one of the things that has happened, and that is isn't turnable back. And that's part of why there is so much chaos in the moment in the culture, because social institutions which kept the structures going are breaking down because people don't value them. In Boston, when I was growing up, on Sunday you went to church. Now on Sunday you go to the shopping mall. That's a difference in values. Family structures broke down. And we don't have to say values, we just have to look at change. The question is, who rides with change and who gets frightened and tries to grab at the old history? And this is a moment when changing from absolute reality to relative reality is a tremendous opportunity for growth, and it has a lot of scariness to it, but that's part of what our work is. It, um, that shift of reality started to spread into the world through minstrels like Bob Dylan, and like the Jefferson Airplane, and the Grateful Dead, and uh, Rolling Stones, and Big Brother, and on and on. Um, and it's gotten so far now, I'll tell you how far it's gotten, that if I speak now in the Middle West, which I'll be doing in a few weeks when I'm on tour, if I speak in a relatively medium-sized city, I can look at an audience in which 70 to 80% of the audience has never taken psychedelics, they have never read Eastern literature, they've never been to the East, and I can say exactly the same things I said in 1965 or 70, which then were heard by an audience of a few people between 15 and 25, and that audience is going, yes. <laughs> the audience in the Midwest is saying, yeah, we hear you. Now, how do they hear us? What happened? How did those values get inculcated into the culture? I think because you can't see it. 
you don't think it exists. But then when you get these little clues around the edge, you begin to see the profundity of what the social changes that were wrought at that point in the 60s. The Grateful Dead now is a major religious uh, ritual. <laughs> Our work with the dying, the work started really by Eric Cass and people like that way back, beautiful men. Uh, that has done incredibly in terms of awakening us, bringing death out of the closet. And a lot of the way in which now so many people want to work with the dying comes out of that kind of psychedelic process that happened in the 60s. Okay, I uh, think I should say something about the mistakes. Um, <coughs> Of the, of the early 60s of our research. Um, in one way, I kind of am with Timothy, what mistakes, it was life, we did the best we could. So I don't say these in some sense of, um, I don't know what sense I say them, I'll just say them. <laughs> when we did that research at Harvard, very shortly, after the beginning, we realized that this was a heresy to that social institution. That the Harvard is an institution committed to the intellect and to rational analytic process. And when we brought on something that dealt with intuitive, transcendent, um, unitive experiences, in which the intellect became a subsystem rather than the metasystem, we were taking on the priest class of the church and we were doing it within the confines of that church. And what we were doing is going on to a football, and to a tennis court with football cleats, the way I would understand it. And I think that once we got going, um, because we were ingesting our own product, we lost our connection with the community around us. And I feel that this was neither our fault nor their fault. It was one of the results of the profundity of this experience that we couldn't turn away and couldn't turn back. But it did, we did lose our support system and we didn't slow down enough to, to keep it with us because it finally got to the point of who's taken it and who hasn't. And that bridge became unbridgeable after a while. And it was shocking to us that people we loved and worked with as colleagues no longer were our colleagues. I think we got a little confused about evolution and revolution. And I think we played with the revolutionary aspect of psychedelics, when to me the far more interesting issue are the evolutionary aspect. And I think that had we been more evolved in our wisdom and not feeling we were inventing the wheel all over again, we would have had an appreciation of what the fears were of the society and how to work with those fears rather than just pitting ourselves against them. I don't think the way we did it was the only way it could have been done. I think we were all enthusiastic about how easy behavior change would be. When I look at many of my friends that, were, that I took acid with in the 60s, I see that there's been a lot of work they've done, but there's a lot yet to do. And I remember Tim and I had a chart on the wall of how soon everybody would get enlightened. It involved putting acid in the water supply, but it still is going to be very soon how we would retool Detroit when nobody wanted cars in them. But the real changes are harder. I think we downplay the fact that, that the psychedelic experience isn't necessarily for everybody. And that people intuitively can be trusted. We did say this in Politics of Consciousness. We said people must control their own consciousness and all we have a right to do is educate people as to what the issues are and where you can go and what to be careful of and what to be aware of. And I think that we were somewhat 
<laughs> insensitive to the issues of the people that weren't really ready to handle this. Um, on my personal era, in view of the, pe the fear people have of their children, for their children and other children, uh, was in uh, giving psychedelics to undergraduates. That started a chain, and uh, I did that for many reasons. Sexual was not excluded. <laughs> now, uh, But at this point, the genie is out of the bottle. Plenty of us know the difference between crack and psilocybin. Plenty of us will continue to do just what we are doing, to work on our consciousness, laws notwithstanding. Truth cannot be repressed. It cannot be legislated out of existence. Perhaps today, Judge Ginsburg won't make it to the Supreme Court. I'm not sure that's bad, actually. And only a few congressmen can admit to smoking grass. But tomorrow it will be different. Psychedelics are a healthy pseudopod of a society. And they have to be honored, and they will be honored. You understand that the government's reaction is predictable and understandable. And I feel pain for their fear of change. But change is in the air. And we can't be hypocritical and make believe that it's ever going to be the same again. Because it isn't. I feel that psychedelics just as our American Indian friend said that it was a part of his life, I feel they have changed my life in the most profound way. I honor them and will continue to honor them. And I will stand up as a person who has had psychedelics many times more than 400, which is the usual published report. And I continue to take psychedelics. If I am psychotic, I am a sample. <laughs> but maybe I'm not. And maybe that was the training that was part of my preparation to be a social philosopher or a wise person in society. This meeting is a meeting in which in all of our hearts we know truth. How it will manifest outward depends on our commitment to our own truth. Now, as we face the ecological issues at the times, the political issues at the times, change and potential chaos, people that have already dealt with that chaos of mind, psychedelically, will be there to lend this culture strength and equanimity in the face of uncertainty. Thank you.